What's up guys, Tom here and welcome to my channel. It's great to be finally filming after all this time in such a beautiful, picturesque and vibrant coloured and quality lighting environment. Well, maybe when the quarantine is over and they stop throwing people in jail here in Australia. Today we're going to be talking about the coronavirus, aka the coronavirus disease of 2019 or COVID-19, aka the SARS-CoV-2 virus or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Corona 2 virus, coronavirus 2. AKA the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The seriousness of this pandemic and what we can do to protect ourselves. There's so much misinformation out there all over social media and all over the media in general. All the information I'm providing here today has come from publicly peer-reviewed research papers on the coronavirus since its existence has been found as well as other general clinical tips and interventions that we would normally use, say, in hospitals for other infectious diseases. If you don't already know me, my name's Tom. I'm currently working as an Australian pharmacist in a hospital setting where we're actually taking care of some of these COVID-19 cases. Right, so let's get back to where this absolute write-off of 2020 first began. In December of 2019, China notified the world that it had come across a novel virus that had previously not been discovered before that was causing flu-like symptoms and some pneumonia in some of its population. These cases began to rapidly spread throughout China with cases doubling in days. This new virus was given the name of COVID-19 and fast forwarding to today with 1.43 million cases reported across 209 countries worldwide, as well as 82,000 reported deaths. You can see things got out of hand pretty quickly. 82,000 deaths in only a few months. Well, luckily for you, I'm here today to help alleviate some of your concerns. But firstly, we need to understand a little bit about the virus itself. The virus is basically a microscopic bowl of fats, as we call lipids, protein and RNA, which act as the genetic code. COVID-19 invades our cells using, using its little crown spikes, where it hijacks all of our cells' infrastructure and equipment to reproduce its own viral proteins and assemble the little virus particles. It'll do this over and over and over again until there's millions of little viral particles in our cell reaching a critical mass where our cells essentially burst. This releases the virus and allows it to go and spread around the body and affect other cells. This notably occurs within our intestines, the spleen, and the one that's on most of our minds, our lungs as well. In the case of our lungs, it's actually the cells that form the outline of our lung cavity that get infected. They're known as the epithelial cells. Essentially their role is just to make a bit of a border around the lungs so that it stays nice and sterile and free from bugs coming up, say, through the gut and other areas. Binding to a specific molecule we believe to be the ACE2 receptor, it allows COVID-19 entry into our cells where it hijacks all the equipment, replicates itself and then begins its invasion. This process usually goes on for about 5 to 14 days, which is known as the incubation period, which is essentially the period of time it takes before we start to feel unwell. And this allows millions and millions of the COVID-19 viral particles to invade a whole bunch of our cells in our body, which after that incubation period will initiate a full-blown immune response. Most of the time, many people experience symptoms such as a dry cough and a fever, headache, and a little bit of general malaise or unwell. Um, and then they will recover and get over it without any complications at all. The insidious part of COVID-19 is that in some cases it can actually interfere with our immune response by interrupting all of the chemical messengers that our cells will normally produce to coordinate the response. It interrupts those, known as cytokines, and pretty much sends all of our frontline fighter cells into a panic. When these cells go into a panic, they will pretty much indiscriminate and kill all of the cells in the lungs, the infected and the uninfected alike. Over time, this leads to significant scar tissue forming and in some cases perforations or holes forming in the lung cavity wall. When these walls break down, it allows bacteria from all other parts of our body access into our lungs, which were otherwise sterile as I mentioned, where it creates a whole bunch of opportunistic infections where they invade all of the other lung cells and in particular our little alveoli air sacs. These sacs essentially are what allow us to get oxygen out of the air and transport it through the body in the blood. When these get damaged, we get a very aggressive form of pneumonia. These are the people that require mechanical ventilation and intensive care to survive. As time progresses and our immune system continually depletes itself and becomes overworked, these opportunistic infections build up to the point where it overcomes our natural defenses and unfortunately leads to death. 
So, how does COVID-19 get around? Well, we believe it to be by respiratory droplets that go in the air or on surfaces. Most infections will occur when someone comes across someone who's been infected with the virus and then they inhale these little respiratory droplets that come out every time they cough or sneeze. Alternatively, the virus can persist on surfaces ranging from a few hours up to a week in some studies. This does depend on what the surface material is, ranging from things such as glass and ceramics from all the way up to brick and timber. I'll do another video on this to help break down what the surfaces are, how long the virus has supposedly lived on these surfaces, and what we can do to disinfect them. But for now, okay, thinking surfaces. So, door handles, car keys, wallets, FBOS keypads if you go and buy things now that we're not using cash, keyboards for computers, kitchen bench top at home, everything. Usually in this case, someone will go along and touch these surfaces that have been contaminated, then later on go and maybe pick their nose or put their finger in their mouth or scratch their eye, things like that, which allows the virus entry into the body that way. In terms of COVID-19 severity, well, if it wasn't already clear from the stats at the beginning of this video, it's pretty bad. And for those people who keep calling it similar to the flu and oh, it's flu-like, it's not as bad as the flu, well, you're wrong, you're wrong man. sorry. COVID-19 seems to be able to outmatch the seasonal flu both in terms of severity as well as in terms of infectivity. Even surpassing the last great influenza outbreak we had which was the swine flu outbreak of 0910. Well, if it's that bad Tom, what outcome are we likely to get? Well, that depends on us and what we do. Pandemics that spread very rapidly through communities and countries, resulting in a large number of infected cases all at once, generally will overwhelm the healthcare system many countries have in place, lead to a large number of deaths, and is usually the one that we'll remember in a hundred years time. Think Spanish flu back in the 1918, which killed hundred million people. Pandemics that we are somewhat able to control the rate and spread of are usually the ones that we get a better outcome with, simply because it allows our healthcare systems time to be able to prepare themselves so that they can take on the brunt of the force when the virus arrives and they're still able to provide care for the people that need it when they are infected. This second option is the one that we would want. It's the one that usually gets society back to normal much quicker and is usually forgotten to history. Quarantine procedures, social isolation and distancing and hand washing are all things we can do as individuals to help slow the rate of the viral spread throughout our countries. If we're able to slow the spread of the virus enough, it allows our healthcare systems time to be able to prepare all the things they need, such as sourcing gloves and masks for healthcare workers, actually making sure there's enough healthcare workers, setting up wards in the hospital that are, are isolated so that the infection doesn't spread uncontrollable throughout the hospital since everyone else needs to go to the hospital for other ailments. And it allows for our researchers and scientists to have more time to be able to go and look into the virus and learn more about it and its behaviours and maybe find some weak points which leads to possible treatment options through clinical trials and also vaccine production. Many countries around the world are slowly starting to report that they are starting to contain the virus and control the rate of spread a little bit better. There is always a risk for secondary outbreaks once the initial outbreak has been controlled, which is why we all have to stay vigilant in our communities. I plan on making more videos about all of the things we can do in detail, such as the disinfecting of surfaces, how to hand wash appropriately, should we wear gloves and masks. Oh, that's a doozy that's been going around the media. I'll also do a video where I can provide some information on the latest treatment clinical trials that are currently being undertaken around the world to see if we can use any sort of drugs and medicine to kill off the virus. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please like and leave a comment. Leave any sort of feedback for me. It works out for me. It helps the YouTube algorithm uh, push out the video so that other people may be able to discover it as well. If you're interested in seeing any of the other content that I described previously, make sure to hit the subscribe button with the notification bell on. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Please remember to go and share a laugh with someone and I'll see you in the next one.